United States of America for the Apostolic Joanite Church, and I'm told that this morning I'm talking about the Sacrament of Confirmation. This is one of a series of talks that I've given at conclaves regarding the sacraments of the church, and if memory serves, we are almost complete, so which means I'll have to probably start over. Um, not that things have changed, but certainly my knowledge and my understanding of the sacraments has changed over time. My hope is that this year the talk about confirmation will be somewhat less controversial than some of our previous discussions. And I'm knocking on wood there. Um, because the sacrament of confirmation, I think, is is one that is fairly well established both historically and theologically in the sacramental churches. The sacrament of confirmation, or chrismation, as it's sometimes referred to, especially in the Eastern churches, is one of the seven traditional sacraments. And this I mention because there are some questions historically about its status as a sacrament, and we'll get into that. In this sacrament, the Holy Ghost is given, that this is the primary sort of theological content of the Sacrament of Confirmation. It is an anointing in which the candidate becomes a Christ, an anointed one. And this is the original sort of meaning of the term Christian, not a follower of Christ, but one who is anointed. Uh, so this is uh, an important part of the journey of, of the Christian. It is considered to be the perfection of baptism. That is to say, it, it's not separate from baptism in a real sense. It is the, the sort of culmination of the baptismal journey. In fact, uh, I'll read here briefly from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacrament of confirmation together constitute the sacraments of Christian initiation, whose unity must be safeguarded. It must be explained to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. So it is the sort of bookend to the, the baptismal uh, journey. But also, when we talk about confirmation, you'll often hear terminology that pertains to, to spiritual combat, that you become a soldier of Christ. And uh, this is uh, something that has been sort of an issue, strangely, uh, regarding the uh, administering the sacrament of confirmation to women. And in fact, I want to read just very, very briefly from uh, Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, where he actually makes the argument that uh, confirmation absolutely should be administered to women, and makes a, an interesting statement here. Now, let me just go ahead and pull this up real quickly. Uh, this is in the third part, question 72, which is all about the sacrament of, of confirmation. And in article 8, if I recall correctly, yes, the objection is given. So he writes, further, as Pope Melchiades says, although the benefit of regeneration suffices for those who are on the point of death, the graces of confirmation are necessary for those who are to conquer. Confirmation arms and strengthens those to whom the struggles and combats of the world are reserved. And he who comes to die, having kept unsullied the innocence he acquired in baptism, is confirmed by death, for after death he can sin no more. So the sacrament should uh, be given in this case, uh, should not be given to those who are on the point of death because they have to undergo combat. Right? And I think that this is, is sort of an interesting point, that, that if you're not going to be combating anymore, then you don't need confirmation. Of course, he you know, says that uh, in earthly contests, fitness of age, physique, and rank, uh, I 
lost my place here. Uh, age, physique, and rank are required, and consequently, slaves, women, old men, and boys are debarred from taking part therein. He's talking about actual warfare. But in heavenly combats, the stadium is open equally to all, to every age and to either sex. And again, he's quoting uh, Chrysostom here. Uh, he says, in God's eyes, even women fight. Oh, isn't that lovely? Um, for many a woman has waged the spiritual warfare with the courage of man. And for some have rivaled men in the courage with which they have suffered martyrdom. And here's where, where uh, St. John uh, Chrysostom is, uh, I think, absolutely on point. And he says, and some have indeed shown themselves stronger than men. Of course, as men, we know that this is more regularly the case than anybody wants to admit, but it's good that uh, St. Thomas uh, acknowledges this. He says, therefore, the sacrament should be given equally to men and women. Uh, so the idea of, of combat is, is an important part of the, the sacrament of, of confirmation. So it's uh, brought up explicitly that, uh, that the purpose of this sealing, of this anointing, is to make you a soldier of, uh, of, of uh, the, the Christian church. There's a lot of different terms that are used to describe uh, the sacrament of, of confirmation. Uh, so there seem to be equal terms in both the Greek and the Latin, so for the Eastern and Western churches. Um, uh, Babiosis or confirmatio, okay, from whence our word confirmation, making fast or making sure. Uh, teleosis or consummatio, perfecting or completing. Uh, signi, uh, sig, signaculum, sigillum or sphragis. I'm better with the Greek than I am with the Latin today. Uh, a sealing, right? Uh, that that a, a seal is placed on the confirmand. Um, epithesis chiron, the imposition of hands. Uh, unction, uh, untio, chrismatio, chrisma, Muran, anointing. Um, and the most common now are confirmatio, or confirmation in the West, and tumura, uh, myron uh, oil uh, in the East. The historical source of the sacrament of confirmation is, of course, the Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit as a tongue of flame on the uh, apostles. And there's lots of debate about the ultimate historical origin of the Sacrament of Confirmation, which has raised questions of its sacramentality. One of the requirements of the mysteries or the sacraments of the church is that they have a scriptural historical basis, that they be instituted by, by, by Christ himself by, and by the apostles. And we never explicitly see confirmation in the context of, of the New Testament. So there has been some uh, debate about the status of confirmation as a sacrament. But the argument is generally that it is a, a, an act that is promised by Christ in, uh, in, in the New Testament. And particularly invoked is uh, the eighth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, I quote here, the apostles sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for he was not yet come upon any of them, but they were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands upon them and they received the Holy Ghost. And that seems to be very, very consistent with the ideas of, of confirmation. The Catholic Encyclopedia, one of my go-to sources for these talks, uh, concludes from these two passages, there's a, a following passage in, in Acts as well, we learn that in the earliest ages of the church there was a rite distinct from baptism in which the Holy Ghost was conferred by the imposition of hands and that the power to perform this ceremony was not implied in the power to baptize. And that's going to become important when we start to talk about the ordinary minister of the sacrament of, of confirmation. 
Confirmation is, in some sense, a personal Pentecost. It is the moment where the Holy Spirit descends upon us to do the work which we are set out to do in the context of the church. St. Cyril of Jerusalem gives a beautiful uh, expression to this, this whole sort of structure. He writes, To you also, after you had come up from the pool of the sacred streams, was given the chrism, unction, the emblem of that wherewith Christ was anointed, and this is the Holy Ghost. This holy ointment is no longer plain ointment, nor so as to say common after the invocation, but Christ's gift, and by the presence of his Godhead, it causes in us the Holy Ghost. I could probably talk for the next two hours just about that phrase, that it causes in us the Holy Ghost. It occasions in us the Holy Ghost. This, this symbolically anoints thy forehead and thy other senses. And the body indeed is anointed with visible ointment, but the soul is sanctified by the holy and life-giving spirit. To you not in figure, but in truth, because you were in truth anointed by the spirit. That's from the mystagogical catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem. So I think that that's sort of a beautiful summation of, of what the sacrament of, of confirmation is all about. To turn to the, the technical aspects, and we always, partially for the benefit of our seminarians, like to march through the form, matter, intent, ordinary minister, recipient, and so on and so forth, because uh, we're going to ask them to write papers about it, and then you know, they have a good source for it. Um, the recipient for the sacrament of confirmation is anyone who has been baptized. And there is the necessity of baptism prior to confirmation because confirmation is the completion or the consummation of baptism. So it makes no sense to confirm without baptism any more than it would make sense to, from a magical context, to uh, consecrate without first purifying. It's necessary, first of all, because confirmation completes baptism, but also because it imprints an indelible mark, and this was therefore something that was like baptism done only once. The Roman Church, the Catholic Church, says that everyone ought to receive this mark. And St. Thomas says, confirmation is to baptism what growth is to generation. I like that. The Council of Trent suggests that it is not expedient that the sacrament be administered before the age of reason. Of course, this is one of the big differences in the administration of the sacrament in the Eastern or Orthodox churches versus the Western or Catholic churches. Because in the East, confirmation is always done immediately after baptism. It, is, it forms, as it were, a sort of single two-part ceremony. The form of the ritual is established from a pretty early date and is, is uh, fairly consistent uh, both across the East and the West. In the uh, Latin churches, Acipe signilacum doni spiritus sancti, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, in, in Greek, the, the language is slightly different. Uh, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit, but the language is, is remarkably similar. And a renewal of the baptismal promises is very, very common within the context of the form. The matter of the sacrament is open to a certain amount of debate. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, Bellarmine, Maldona, uh, Maldonados, uh, all insist that the matter is the oil whether that oil is placed just on the forehead, that's common in the West, or uh, all over uh, various points of the body uh, in the East, uh, similar to, to baptism, uh, is, is open to, to some debate as well. Uh, St. Thomas insists that the sealing on the forehead is most important because it places the seal on a prominent visible place. And it also references the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost as a tongue of flame. 
The oil that's used has to be blessed by the bishop or in the east by the patriarch. So this is not uh, a simple oil, but it has already been blessed uh, prior to the ritual. Aureolus and Patavius say that what is the matter of the, sa of the sacrament is actually the laying on of hands. Of course, in Eastern practice, and we've commented on this in, in previous years, anointing with oil and laying on the hands are equivalent gestures both represent a kind of, of sealing. Uh, modernists and Tapper uh, insist that it can be either, that the, the form uh, uh, can take, take either. The intent is to complete the sacrament of baptism, to become unified with the church, and to receive the Holy Spirit for spiritual combat. The ordinary minister of the church uh, ordinary, ordinary minister of the sacrament, rather, is the bishop. And this is one of the reasons that uh, it was important to say that it was not included in the power to baptize. Because the power to baptize is, of course, administered to, uh, to, to any priest, right? And even to lay people and even to the unbaptized uh, in cases of exigency or emergency. But the power to confirm seems to be reserved in the Western churches to the bishop. It can be administered by priests in cases of exigency, and in the Orthodox churches, the priest is the usual minister because it is the continuation of the baptism. There is the practice of having sponsors or presenters for confirmation. And interestingly, Western practice insists that certain people are excluded from uh, the opportunity to be sponsors or presenters for confirmation. Uh, the father and mother uh, of the, the candidate cannot serve in this. Members of religious orders are not allowed to uh, present unless the candidate is uh, you know, a, a religious. And except in cases of necessity, the baptismal uh, godparent cannot be the presenter or sponsor. And I always found that very, very interesting that there are these exclusions um, that doesn't seem to be, the presenter doesn't seem to be absolutely essential, although it is an almost uh, uh, ubiquitous practice. Uh, it's almost never done without the, the sponsors or presenters. And there are those who argue very strenuously that it is a necessary part of the rite. In the Apostolic Jonah Church, we do have presenters that that, uh, that is preserved. Uh, we do use the the uh, anointing with oil, of course, and the imposition of hands, and we do use the traditional formula. So our uh, sacrament is in conformity with the uh, traditional form, matter, and intent of, of the sacramental churches. As I said before, historically, in the Catholic Church, confirmation is given after the age of, of discretion. Uh, so uh, usually in the, the uh, sort of early teens, um, th this is a fairly standard practice. In the East, it is done with baptism. In fact, uh, uh, Callistos uh, has an interesting sort of comment on, on chrismation uh, in the Orthodox tradition. He writes, through chrismation, Every member of the church becomes a prophet and receives a share in the royal priesthood of Christ. All Christians alike, because they are chrismated, are called to act as conscious witnesses to the truth. And he quotes the uh, first letter to John here. You have an anointing from the Holy One and know all things. So as I said, it is done with baptism, confirmation and baptism together form what's sometimes referred to as the holy illumination. And I think that this idea of illumination is connected to Callistos' uh, assertion that, that every confirmed or chrismated Christian becomes a prophet. And it is never delayed to a later date in the Eastern churches. So it's always done, uh, always done immediately after baptism. 
One of the things that I think is, is interesting in the context of the Orthodox tradition is that there is an epiclesis. There is an invocation of the Holy Spirit. Of course, this is significant in terms of the difference between Western and Eastern practice of the Eucharist, where the invocation of the Holy Spirit is the moment in which the ordinary elements of bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. So I find it interesting that there is an epiclesis here as well. Whereas in the West, uh, chrismation is simply on the forehead. Uh, in the East, it is the forehead, the eyes, the nose, the ears, the lips, the chest, the back, the hands, and the feet. So it is very much the whole the whole body. And typically, what follows chrismation is the tonsure, where in the form of a cross, some of the hair is cut. There is a particular epistle and gospel that is uh, uh, traditional with the uh, baptism confirmation. And I actually just want to read these uh, real quickly because I think that they provide an interesting context for how this is understood. The epistle uh, is from the letter of Paul to the Romans. And he writes, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him. This is a terminology that I think a lot of us uh, are familiar with, and to die to the old self. So that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. For we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again, death no longer having dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So that you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The gospel is uh, from Matthew. In chapter 28. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee and to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. So I think that these, these readings give us a sense of, of how this path of baptism, confirmation, moving on into the spiritual combat of being a Christian is understood in the, the Eastern Church. In the Protestant churches, confirmation was one of the first things to get excluded from sacramental practice. Uh, because it does not have a particular scriptural or, or biblical uh, precedent, it was, it was excluded right off the bat and its sacramentality was denied. So confirmation does seem to be something that is unique to the, the uh, sacramental apostolic churches. Within the context of the apostolic Joanite church, now we've sort of looked at the tradition, look at how we do it. The bishop, of course, is the ordinary minister. The priest uh, can uh, confirm with uh, the permission of the bishop. We do, in keeping with tradition, use presenters, and so that the, the confirmant is presented to the community of which they are going to become a part. And I think that there is a strong sense in the, the Jonite practice that that with confirmation, you become, or one becomes, most fully a member of the AJC community. That this, uh, this sealing is a way of 
of bringing you into the completion of, of communion with the Apostolic Joanite Church. And so it makes sense that the candidate be presented to the community. Um, we don't place excessive conditions on the presenters as the Western churches do. I don't know that there are any uh, particular uh, uh, conditions placed on that, that anyone can serve as a, a presenter for the confirmation. There is a commitment to the principles of the church. There, that is to say that, that one sort of verbally and, and publicly announces a, a sort of general commitment to the goals and aims and values of the AJC. Not in the way that one might do in holy orders, of course, which requires a much more, more serious commitment to the, the specific principles of, of the church but here a, a general sort of assent. There is a first anointing, and this is not the sacrament. This is not the, uh, the sort of uh, sacramental anointing of confirmation, but a sort of preliminary anointing. Uh, but we still use the terminology of being sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and anointing is done generally on the forehead. And this is the sacramental moment of the rite of, of confirmation. Um, we use a similar form, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, but I don't think that there's any reason that the Eastern form couldn't be used, that that, that terminology is so close uh, that the intent seems to be uh, absolutely identical. Within the context of the Apostolic Joanite Church, we also have a, uh, a rite of reception, which is, strictly speaking, not sacramental but it is for those who have already been confirmed in some other faith community. That is to say, because uh, there is an indelible seal that comes with confirmation, this would never be redone. We would never redo a confirmation. Uh, this, uh, as is the case with baptism, is a gesture, I think, toward the universality of the church, that ultimately, the AJC is one part of, of a broader universal and unbroken church. And so it would be uh, inappropriate, it would be improper to, uh, to repeat the sacrament of confirmation. So we have this uh, rite of reception that in many ways mirrors some of the language and the, the intent of confirmation, but it brings uh, the candidate into communion with our church in particular. Ultimately, confirmation seems in many ways like a minor addition to baptism. That baptism clearly has this, this momentous import. It is, uh, in most cases, the absolute first of the sacraments. And the confirmation seems like sort of an afterthought. So that, and I think that this is, is a mistake because it is vitally important as an initiatory practice. As I spoke about yesterday in talking about the relationship of, of the liturgy to the practice of magic, uh, René Guénon insists that the Christian sacraments originally had an initiatory character. And as the Christian churches became exoteric, that initiatory character was lost. And I think that within the context of the AJC, we seek always to retain that initiatory character for all of our ritual practices, but most particularly the, uh, the sacraments. And I think that as a moment of initiation, the sacrament of confirmation is vitally, vitally important. And considering the relationship to the Holy Spirit and to the, the role that that plays in both Jonah theology generally and Gnostic practice uh, you know, even more broadly, I think that confirmation holds a special place for the AJC and for Gnostics in general, because it is that moment in which we become the Holy Spirit, in which the Holy Spirit is affected in us. And I think that for the Gnostic, that presence of the Spirit is absolutely essential. So, at this point, I want to open it up to any questions uh, that you guys might have. As I said, hopefully the question and answer will be somewhat less contentious in, uh, than in earlier 
uh, earlier years. Uh, but if there are any questions, yeah, Jonathan. So um, I can only speak to my own upbringing where there was actually, I mean, this wouldn't be part of the sacrament in any sense, but there was a confirmation class that had to be completed mm -hmm. prior to the presentation of the confirmation of the actual sacrament itself. How common <coughs> in general would you estimate that is in Western Christianity? You know, kind of in Western point. Christianity, it is extremely common that that, that training for confirmation because there is a sense, and this I think speaks to why, uh, particularly in the Catholic Church, baptism and confirmation are separated by so many years, and why it's considered that uh, one would not uh, undertake confirmation until the age of discretion. That if baptism, particularly in the form of infant baptism, is, is bringing you into the church sort of without your consent, without your... Uh, you know, conscious acknowledgement, right? I, I don't want to, you know, make it seem like it's some sort of, you know, violent uh, enslavement to the church or anything like that. But, but confirmation is a conscious choice, right? Confirmation is me saying, yes, right? This thing that happened before, I'm cool with that. I'm okay with that. And now I'm going to recommit myself consciously, knowingly, willingly to that and to complete this, this practice. And I think that uh, because there is some, some education, some training, you're going into it more clearly with eyes open. And this is why I think that the, it's uh, considered to be a completion of baptism. And it occurs to me that this is a really good defense of, of infant baptism, right? The question of in, infant baptism is, is been one that has raged for, for centuries um, and you know, sort of continues on today. That, you know, how is it that you can sort of uh, perform this ritual on an, on an infant who has no capacity to, uh, to, to consent or to, to understand what's going on? Well, it's not done, right? It's not finished. You've just started the ritual, right? That, that ritual actually takes 12, 13, 14, however many years to complete, so that when that baptism is completed with confirmation, it's done by somebody who knows what they're doing, who's able to consent, who has the age of discretion, who has a certain amount of education and training. So I think that that's extremely common and, and probably a very, very good thing. That, that, that's probably uh, something that, that would, would be a practice that we would recommend to anyone. Any other questions? Yes, Monsignor Scott. Do you think it might be a holdover from when uh, the catechumens had to have a certain level of initiation? I, I think so. so. I think so, yeah. In order to teach your children the mysteries of Christianity, they have to be baptized, and then, but to know that they know the mysteries or they know the information, they have to be confirmed. I, I, that makes a certain amount of sense to me. I'm not sure, about, I mean, I'm always loath to. Uh, to try to ascribe some particular interpretation or understanding to historical peoples. I just, I think that's just an incredibly fraught idea, but it certainly makes sense to me. Uh, and I think that, uh, that we always have to read these practices in light of this distinction between sort of hearers and, and catechumens and that, that these finer distinctions were an important part of the early church. Uh, in the Theocletian, right, uh, Theocletian form of the, the AJC uh, liturgy, of course, there is the, the doors, the doors, right? This moment where the doors are guarded and the, the chamber is sealed. It's very dramatic, or at least it's very dramatic when I'm screaming at the altar. But um, <laughs> that, that this is a gesture to this early uh, initiatory, esoteric dimension of sacramental practice that this was not for everyone. This was not for poi polloi. This was for those who had already demonstrated a certain degree of commitment. So I think that you're absolutely right. And that has a lot to say about the initiatory character of these sacraments. I was just gonna point out, talking about the form, um, that we actually use uh, all of them. They, they, we, we have we have two actions so technically just like you know if you take communion 
uh, with the host and with the wine, you're not taking communion twice, you're taking it once, and each is the whole, right? So you're not taking less if you only do one, and you're not right. taking more if you do both. Yeah. Uh, uh, so in confirmation, we actually have, you know, strengthen, O Lord, thy servant, mm -hmm. with, with thy Holy Spirit, with the laying on of hands, and then we have be sealed. Oh, with, oh, you're saying that we've got, both, oil. Uh, we've got we've got both east and, and west, and yeah. the actions are the same, but you're not getting bonus Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, that that, yeah. that either one would be sufficient, but you know, both yeah. is not more. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. We're we're uh, sacramentally paranoid and cover all our bases. I think there's nothing wrong with that. Was there a question over here? Yeah, yeah. you mentioned that the the practice was abandoned by Protestants because of lack of biblical precedent. Yes. Is, is there any any link to pinpointing the actual origins of the, the ceremony that come from the pre-Christian mystery school type? Uh, n n no, it appears to be, I mean, obviously the practice of, of anointing as kind of consecration or initiatory practice extends far, far before Christianity, I mean, obviously. Um, but the particular form that confirmation takes seems to be um, particularly apostolic. So it seemed to emerge in the time of, of the apostolic college. Um, the problem for Protestants is that you can't, you know, you can look in, in, in scripture and see a baptism. You can look and see uh, a wedding. You can look and see, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, holy orders, right? You don't see that. You don't see confirmation explicitly. Uh, but there is in the Pentecostal promise, right, that I will send you a comfort, right, the necessary uh, sort of um, scriptural precedent for, uh, for the ritual. But the, the rite itself, I mean, it makes sense that, that early Christians would have drawn on uh, pre-Christian forms. I mean, there's no point in reinventing the wheel, right? Um, but the, the specifics of the practice do seem to be uniquely Christian. See, here's where I'm at. This is, this is where his grace needs to have me in the front row. Fight me, bro. The, the, uh, um, I actually think that there is a scriptural precedent for it. And I, I just think Protestants do some hand-waving away. In, there's a couple of instances in Acts where uh, the apostles uh, come by people who have already been baptized by John as John Christians specifically. Right. And they don't repeat the baptism, so they do the laying on of hands mm. in, in Acts. I think there's two incidences where hands are laid when somebody would have already been a member or when somebody comes from a different community. So it seems, so yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not explicit kind of thing. Yeah. Grace is right. There's, there's nothing that specifically uh, uh, the repeats the The takeaway there is that I'm right, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> on, pa on paper. <laughs> on, on paper, it walks right up like Moses to the promised land, and you know. But uh, uh, I think confirmation is certainly implied several times yeah. in Acts. It just doesn't take the. It has the laying on of hands for people who are already baptized, but there, uh, there, there's nothing. And it says, you know, receive the Holy Spirit, um, but there's nothing that talks about uh, a, a sealing and we can't be sure that given that these folks were coming into discipleship type roles, we can't be sure that that wasn't ordination also. Yeah. So yeah, the yeah, price is right on paper. Um, I think that, uh, I think I'm right though. Sorry. <laughs> Brent, you had a... There's a, there's a section here that I've been kind of teaching for a while that I'm, I'm looking for clarification or at least confirmation that I'm doing correctly. And that's in our liturgy where there's that kind of dangly part there's water and water, there's fire and prison. Well, we're constructing the all we're constructing the ecclesia at that point in time, and I've always thought that that, ref, that that phrase was in reference to the waters of baptism and the fires of confirmation. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And that seems to suggest not only piggybacking off of your lecture yesterday in terms of purification. Mm -hmm. But also in a very Masonic, rough, Ashley, to smooth out the Ashley kind of way. Oh, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it in those terms. Of, of creating a person to be a stone worthy 
of huh. uh, construction into the sacred ecclesia. I, I never thought about it in, the, in those terms, but certainly, um, you know, it has that ring of truth, right? To, you know, you say it and I go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, of course, right? <laughs> so, so I'm not aligned with that. Absolutely, I, no, I don't think so at all, though I, I admit I've never thought of it in those terms. And, and that's strange because the, the, the rough and the finished ashlar are, are it's one of my favorite sort of symbols within within the craft tradition. So uh, so it's funny that I would have overlooked that, but uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There was a, I was just gonna say, there was a discussion with this guy's in the head last night, um, talking about the, how the pattern is repeated, uh, um, you know, in the person, in the mass, and, and in the sanctuary. So I mean, three different levels of time. I mean, you have common and esoteric ritual, for example, you know, we could take the, you know the, the 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 standard of Western initiation for for many esoterics is the Golden Dawn. You have purification with water, mm -hmm. consecration with fire. Uh, you know, in the sanctuary for the mass and the temple, you have the purification with uh, water, consecration with fire, and of course, in the uh, temple of the Holy Spirit, the human body. Uh, you know, as some would say, you have first you have baptism, and then you have confirmation. So this is a pattern that's. Uh, repeated over and over again. And, and, I, and I, I really think like that rough and smooth. Um, one of the things that I always try to do in, in the practice of the liturgy is to make sure that when, you know, when the, the, the chamber is being purified, right, you're also getting the, co the congregation. Yeah. Right? And I like to get everybody a little bit, you know, uh, you know sprinkled. Um, and similarly, when I'm sensing. Right. Yes, I'm sensing the four quarters of the of the chamber, but I also want to make sure that I'm sensing the the, the congregation as well. Uh, the, and it's because it is an echo of, of precisely this practice. There's so many areas in the liturgy where you do one thing with the hosts or the audience, so and you do the same thing with, with the congregation. With the congregation. Yeah. This part feels like one that goes backwards. With the it's that, that have already been, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a mnemonic. It's a, it, it's, it's this mo moment of anamnesis. Yeah, for sure. Constance. I'm kind of intrigued by the role of the presenter. Mm, mm -hmm. I was wondering if it went back to times when the church was being persecuted and the presenter comes in and says, I know this person, mm -hmm. and he is safe. Right, they're not a spy. As yeah. well as like-minded, and I can recommend that it's okay for us to make him one of us. It, it's funny because I think about uh, Stephen O'Shea's story uh, yesterday uh, of you know the woman who wanted to receive the the consolamentum, uh, Cathar uh, woman. And uh, so said, oh, you know, send for the, the parfait. And the local uh, uh, Catholic administration got wind of that. And somebody came in purporting to be uh, the, the parfait to, to administer the consolamentum. Um, Cowans and eavesdroppers, right? I mean, there's, there's always that. So um, I'm not 100% sure. I would, be, I would be loath to sort of commit to that with any certainty, but again, it makes a certain amount of sense, right? That, that you are somebody who's vouching for uh, this person. Um, of course, within the Eastern practice, that's, that's not necessarily the case, uh, but we don't see the level of persecution in the, in the East uh, that we see in, in the West. So, um, maybe backpedal that a little bit, that, uh, so far as my, my historical memory serves. Um, so, so maybe, you know, that was less of, of, of an issue, although the presenters are still present, although it's the baptismal godparents in the, in the case of, of the Orthodox tradition. Um, again, it certainly makes sense to me. I would be loath to uh, attribute a, an intention to an historical people. I just think that that's, that's too fraught a process, um, but it certainly makes sense to me. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? Things are good. Any other questions? All right, then thank you very, very much. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the talks today and our ordination mass. Thank you.